Seven Secrets of the Goddess by Devdutt Patanayak Chapter 3 Gauri's Secret Culture is Dependent on Human Gaze Part 2 From Brahma comes knowledge of Veda. This knowledge exists in the form of poems called mantras, which are chanted during rituals called yagnyas. Details about these yagnyas are compiled in manuals known as brahmanas. The keepers of these brahmana texts were known as brahmins. Killing these knowledge carriers or brahmins was considered the greatest of crimes in the Hindu world as it meant the loss of Vedic knowledge that enabled humanity to turn nature into culture. However, every Puran tells the story of Brahma Hatya Pap, the crime of killing a Brahmin, committed by both Shiva and Vishnu. The Shiva Puran tells us that when Brahma's daughter came into being, he went around her father as a mark of respect. But Brahma desired her. Disgusted by the incestuous cravings of her father, she ran away. He pursued her. Her disgust gave rise to Shiva, who beheaded Brahma and took upon himself the great burden of Brahma Hatya Pap. The Vishnu Puran tells us that Ravan, a Brahmin, abducts Ram's wife, Sita, not remembering that she is actually his daughter who he had abandoned long ago. Ram ultimately overpowers Ravan with the aid of a monkey called Hanuman, who chooses to stay celibate in the service of Sita and Ram. In this narrative, Ravan can be seen as Brahma, Ram as Vishnu and Hanuman as Shiva. Sita is the goddess. While Shiva does not apologize for beheading Brahma, Ram performs austerities to rid himself of the demerit earned for his Brahma Hatya Pap. For Vishnu understands the fears that make a Ravan behave as he does. Images of the goddess in North India are often flanked by images of Hanuman, also called Langur Veer, and a childlike form of Shiva, Bhairav Baba, holding the severed head of a man, alluding to the tale of Brahma's beheading or looking upon Gauri with eyes of desire. This narration of Brahma's incest can be seen literally as reinforcing a social taboo. It can also be seen historically as a reference to the end of the old Vedic culture of Yajna that was eventually replaced by the later Puranic culture of Puja. But it is more meaningful when seen symbolically and Brahma is recognized as the human mind that seeks control over perceived reality. This symbolic explanation clarifies why Brahma is not worshipped in any Hindu temple. Brahma is the human mind that misbehaves. Shiva is the human mind that vehemently rejects this misbehavior. Vishnu is the human mind that does not condone this misbehavior, yet understands it. What is this misbehavior? It is the assumption of property, that culture and all its creation belongs to humans. This assumption is dependent on another assumption, that human value is dependent on property. Shiva. The hermit rejects this assumption. Vishnu, the householder, traces the origin of this assumption to the human fear of validation. We do not know who we are and what the purpose of our life is, so we find solace in creating and hoarding property. That is why Brahma seeks dominion over Devi, while Vishnu and Shiva don't. That is why Brahma is unworthy of worship and that is why his ritual of Yajna described in the Brahmana texts that sought to establish human dominion over nature, was abandoned in favor of Puja, where humanity is encouraged to adore Vishnu, Shiva and Devi. Gauri is more commonly known as Parvati, wife of Shiva, daughter of Himavan, who is god of the Himalayan mountain range, also known as Parvateshwar or lord of the mountains. She is also called Uma. In her previous life, she was Sati, daughter of Daksha, son of Brahma who established the Yajna ritual. Parvati or Uma is the mother of Ganesha and Kartikeya. She is associated with the household. In folk tradition and especially in Tamil temple lore, she is the sister of Vishnu. 
It is Kali who domesticates the hermit Shiva and in the process gets domesticated herself as Gauri. The story is elaborated in the Shiva Purana where Brahma after being beheaded feels that Shiva needs to get a wife. Yes, he went overboard in his relationship with his daughter, but that is no reason to reject culture and stay away from women. So Brahma consults Vishnu and they evoke the goddess who promises to help by taking birth as the daughter of Daksha. Daksha is associated with the yagna, a ritual based on exchange, which is the hallmark of human culture. Animals do not exchange, they grab what they want. Humans are capable of exchange. It forms the cornerstone of human society. During the yagna, Daksha makes offerings to the devas and expects gifts in return. He contributes in order to consume. He offers them his daughter and they in turn ensure that nature provides for all his material needs. He demands obedience from all his daughters and his sons-in-law for the sake of stability and predictability. He fears disobedience as he thinks it will herald the collapse of the structure he has created. More than disobedience, Daksha fears indifference. The tapas winds ignore him and do not care about his yagna. They value tapa, mental fire churned by tapasya, more than agni, physical fire of the yagna. Tapa evokes thoughts that make a man wise. Agni transforms things that make a man rich and powerful. Daksha despises the tapas winds. So it comes as a huge shock for Daksha when his youngest daughter and his favorite child, Sati, shows a preference for Shiva, the supreme tapasvin. When her father does not grant her permission to marry him, she simply leaves the house and follows the naked hermit. To teach her a lesson, Daksha conducts a grand yagna where he invites all his daughters and his sons-in-law, except Sati and Shiva. Sati, as stubborn as her father, arrives at Daksha's doorstep anyway, despite Shiva warning her not to go and demands to be treated as a daughter returning home should be treated. Daksha does no such thing. Instead, he insults her and her husband, explaining why he is not worthy of an invitation to the yagna. He follows no rules. He is covered with ash. He drinks poison and narcotics. He has no family or friends. Alone, he wanders naked in crematoriums in the company of dogs and ghosts. He is unfit for civilization. Sati tries to explain to her father that Shiva is no rebel, but a hermit. He simply does not value himself through social structure, rules and property that indulge human hunger and fear. He performs tapasya and ignites tapa to outgrow hunger and fear. But Daksha does not listen. For Daksha, unquestioning participation in the yagna is the only virtue. So angry is Sati at being unable to get through to her father that she leaps in the pit of fire in the ritual precinct and burns herself to death. Still, the yagna continues, for Daksha refuses to be cowed down by his stubborn, defiant daughter. When Shiva learns of Sati's death, his otherwise tranquil nature gives way to rage. He becomes Rudra, the howler. He tears out the locks of his hair and strikes them to the ground. Out come the sword-wielding Veera Bhadra and Bhadra Kali, manifestations of his outrage. They storm into Daksha's house, disrupt the ceremony, drive away the devas and ultimately behead Daksha. But when the yagna stops, civilization ends. Vishnu appeals to Shiva and begs him to restore the yagna by bringing Daksha back to life. Shiva does that, for he has no problem with the ritual itself. His problem is only with the assumptions and attitude of Daksha, who seems to repeat Brahma's primal incestuous misbehavior. Finally, Daksha is given an animal head, that of a goat, a reminder that a more worthy offering in a yagna is his own desire to dominate and control the world like a dominating alpha goat. Shiva then picks up the charred, lifeless body of Sati and wanders the world, weeping. No more is he the detached hermit. He is now the lover inconsolable in his loss. His pain and suffering disturb the gods who beg Vishnu to put an end to it. For all things have to end, 
even bereavement. So Vishnu cuts Sati's corpse into tiny pieces. These fall in different parts of the world and become Shakti Peethas, centers of goddess worship. With Sati gone, Shiva shuts his eyes and resumes his meditation, withdrawing all attention from the world, generating inner fire and creating a cold, icy, desolate landscape around him. Chapter 3 Gauri's Secret Culture is Dependent on Human Gaze Part 1 Chapter 3 Gauri's Secret Culture is Dependent on Human Gaze Part 3 